particular system and doing actually um, a big bit. So um, basically, you remember our introductory lecture, we talked of um, the skin of the scalp. As you're getting deeper to the internal structures within the skull, you have scalp. Then the last layer of the scalp is the periosteum. Then you get to the skull bone, which has three layers an outer table, diplo, and an inner table. Then you get to the dura mater that has an outer endosteal layer and an inner meningeal layer. Before you get to the subdural space, then arachnoid mater, subarachnoid space with blood vessels, then pia mater, which is very intimate with the, the brain. So basically, the meninges, you have those three layers, the dura, arachnoid, and, and pia mater. The endosteal layer, um, on the inner surface of the cranium, and an inner meningeal layer. At various sites, these layers usually separate and form what you call the dural venous sinuses. Then we can ask you to write about dural reflection. So we have four types of dural reflections. We have the falx cerebri. It's usually sickle shaped found in the midline between the right and left cerebral hemispheres. And it extends from the crista galli, that's uh, part of the ethmoid bone on the anterior cranial fossa, to the internal occipital protuberance that's in the posterior cranial fossa. Then we have the tentorium cerebelli. Now, this one extends from the superior crest of petrous temporal bone. Okay, it's at the superior crest of petrous temporal bone and forms the roof of the posterior cranial fossa. Therefore, it forms a tent over the cerebellum, separating it from the posterior um, occipital lobe of the cerebrum. Usually, it has a free border that forms the uh, tentorial incisure or the tentorial notch. The brainstem usually passes through this tentorial notch. Then we have falx cerebelli. Again, it's a mid sagittal septum, it's at the midline, and it's found below the tentorium. Remember, falx cerebri, cerebri is above the tentorium. This one, falx cerebelli, is below the tentorium and separates the two cerebellar hemispheres. And the last dural reflection is the diaphragma cella. This is a continuation of dura mater that forms the roof of the pituitary fossa or the hypophysial fossa and it's usually perforated by the infundibulum which usually connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. So this is your falx cerebri between the two cerebral hemispheres, falx cerebelli between the two cerebellar hemispheres, this is your tentorium cerebelli separating the cerebellar hemispheres from the cerebral hemispheres and remember we said it has a tentorial notch and then this is your diaphragma cella that forms the roof of the hypophysial fossa and it is perforated by, it has an aperture for pituitary stalk or the infundibulum. So again, remember our falx cerebri from the crista galli anteriorly to the external, internal occipital protuberance and that's your falx cerebri and it has the superior sagittal sinus on top and the inferior sagittal sinus below here. What's the blood supply of dura mater? When you ask this question, you need to divide um, into three the skull into three cranial fossa, so the anterior cranial fossa. The dura mater in this region is supplied by branches of ophthalmic artery, which is from internal carotid artery. So you have ethmoidal and lacrimal branches of ophthalmic artery. And then the middle cranial fossa, the dura is supplied by branches of maxillary artery, which comes from external carotid. So this includes the middle meningeal artery and accessory meningeal arteries, which are from maxillary artery. So dura mater is getting from both internal and external carotid artery. Then posterior cranial fossa gets branches from vertebral. Remember vertebral is from first part of subclavian, occipital artery which is from external carotid artery and ascending pharyngeal also from external carotid artery. Then the meningeal veins will accompany these arteries. So that's how you answer the question on blood supply to dura mater. What's the clinical relevance of learning all this about the dura mater? Remember, there's a terion. Terion is a space, or rather, a place on the skull that uh, is a point of union of four bones. So you have frontal, parietal, squamous temporal, and the greater wing of sphenoid. So these are the uh, bones that form the terion. And because of this, it is a weak point because where all these four bones come to join, it's a weakest point of the skull. And usually, remember, it overlies the frontal branch of the middle meningeal artery, the anterior branch of middle meningeal artery. So when this weakest point uh, uh, fractures, when the terion fractures, what happens? This anterior branch of middle meningeal artery may rupture or tear, and that leads to bleeding outside the dura. And accumulation of blood outside the dura is what we call the extradural hematoma that will be formed. And the patient will have symptoms of raised intracranial pressure because you're having bleeding within the cranium. So the pressure within the cranium will increase and leading to compression of the brain.
This is your terion between the greater wing of sphenoid, the squamous of temporal bone, then you have your parietal bone and the frontal bone. So this is the weakest point. It overlies the anterior branch of middle meningeal artery. So when you fracture this bone, you may tear the anterior branch of middle meningeal artery from maxillary artery, and that will lead to extradural hematoma. What's the innervation of dura mater? It gets branches from trigeminal nerve mostly. So you have ethmoidal, lacrimal, and nervous spinosum. So these three from the trigeminal. Remember, it also gets some sensory twigs from 10th cranial nerve, vagus. Then you have spinal nerves, uh, cervical 1 to 3, C1 to C3. But we also have the 7th and 9th cranial nerves. So 10, 7, and 9 also, together with cranial nerve 5, innervate the dura. Okay, so these are the five sources of innervation of dura mater. So why do you need to know about innervation of dura mater? The brain usually is insensitive to pain. But the dura is not because it has sensory nerves. So dura is very sensitive. So usually when there is bleeding or there is infection of the dura, like in cases of meningitis, the headache that the patient has is because of the ceremonious presentation of meningitis. Okay? Headache and neck stiffness. And it's because of this nerve supply to dura. We have what we call meningeal extensions. And... There are two major extensions. We have meninges extending around cranial and spinal nerve roots, okay, at the level of the ganglia. Like, for example, the ganglia, what is a ganglia? A ganglia is a collection of um, neuronal cell bodies outside the central nervous system. So the ganglion of trigeminal nerve, the fifth cranial nerve, is surrounded by uh, meningeal extensions, extensions of the meninges from the CNS, and that forms the cavum trigeminal or the Merkel's cavity. The second extension we have, the meninges extending and follow from the brain, they follow the optic nerve into the eyeball. And remember, this optic nerve contains the central artery and vein of retina. So they are usually on the anterior part. Therefore, they get into the, um, what is it called? The meninges are surrounding the optic nerve, and the optic nerve contains this central artery and vein. So usually, when there's raised intracranial pressure, when CSF pressure is high in the brain, in the skull, it may follow the meninges that are extending to the optic nerve. Therefore, it's going to even compress the central artery and vein that are within the optic nerve. Therefore, there will be blurring of vision. So, we go to dural venous sinuses. What are dural uh, venous sinuses? They are channels of venous blood, okay, between the dura mater, the two layers of dura mater. So, we have the meningeal layer and the endosteal layer. So, the venous channels located between dura mater and internal periosteum lining of the cranium, they're usually, because they're blood channels, they're lined by endothelium, but remember, they have no valves and they have no muscle in their wall. So, that's what makes them different from veins. No valves and no muscle, and they drain all the blood from the brain eventually. So you divide the dural sinuses into two, the unpaired and the paired. The unpaired include the straight sinus, superior sagittal, inferior sagittal, and occipital sinus, while the paired sinuses include the cavina sinuses, sphenoparietal, superior and inferior petrosol, transverse sinus, and sigmoid sinus. So this is your superior sagittal sinus on the convexity of the um, um, falx cerebri, inferior sagittal sinus on the convexity, concavity of the falx cerebri, and inferior sagittal sinus is joined by great cerebral vein of Galen to form a straight sinus or sinus recti. And then superior sagittal sinus and the straight sinus will meet at the confluence of sinus at the internal occipital protuberance. Then from there, blood from the superior sagittal sinus forms the right transverse sinus, which is bigger than the left, because the left transverse sinus carries less blood from the smaller inferior sagittal sinus. So from the confluence of sinus, you have transverse sinuses. Then the transverse sinuses will be joined by superior petrosal sinuses to form your sigmoid sinus, which is S-shaped. And the sigmoid sinus will be joined by inferior petrosal sinus to form your internal jugular vein. So prior sagittal sinus usually communicates with the veins of the scalp, the forehead, the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses through emissary veins. That's very important to tell you that infection in these places can spread into the superior sagittal sinus via emissary veins. Then we have arachnoid granulations. This is where CSF is usually 
reabsorbed from subarachnoid space into the superior sagittal sinus because of these arachnoid granulations that allow that. So the sinus, uh, superior sagittal sinus will form the right, the blood will now form the right transfer sinus, which is usually bigger than the left. Inferior sagittal sinus is found at the concavity of the falx cerebri and it's joined by the great cerebral vein of Galen to form the straight sinus. And this continues as the left transfer sinus, which carries less blood than the right. So again, superior sagittal sinus there, inferior sagittal joined by great cerebral vein of Galen to form straight sinus, and the superior sagittal sinus forms the right transverse, while the inferior sagittal straight sinus will form the left transverse sinus. So again, that's just to show you superior sagittal sinus coming to the confluence of sinuses, which is usually located at the internal occipital protuberance. Inferior sagittal sinus and the great vein of Galen to form the straight sinus that also comes towards the confluence of sinuses. The superior sagittal sinus, straight sinus, and occipital sinus meet at the confluence of sinuses. The transverse sinuses are joined by superior petrosal sinus to form sigmoid sinus. Okay, And the sigmoid sinus, remember, it communicates uh, with the veins of the scalp, the middle ear, the suboccipital uh, plexus via emissary veins, so you can spread infection. And Sigmoid sinus will be joined by inferior petrosal sinus to form the internal jugular vein. So this um, is what we are saying here, that you have your inferior sagittal sinus with great cerebral vein of Galen to form straight sinus. Then straight sinus, superior sagittal sinus, and occipital sinus meet at the confluence of sinuses. Then you need to understand that at the base of the brain, this is what I was calling the anterior cranial fossa, the middle cranial fossa, and the posterior cranial fossa. So at the confluence of sinus here, the superior sagittal sinus, which is bigger, will form the right transverse sinus, and the straight sinus carries less blood, so that's the left, that's why it's smaller than the right, the left transverse sinus. Transverse sinuses will be joined by superior petrosal sinus to form the S-shaped sigmoid sinus. That's why it's called sigmoid, it's S-shaped. So transverse sinus and the superior petrosal form sigmoid sinus. Then what happens? The sigmoid sinus will be joined by inferior petrosal to form the internal jugular vein. Okay. Again, at the confluence of sinus, this is your transverse sinus, both right and left. Superior petrosol form, joins the transverse to form sigmoid. Okay, and then the sigmoid will be joined by inferior petrosol to form internal jugular vein. So this is your superior sagittal, inferior sagittal, great cerebral vein of Galen, the straight sinus, the confluence of sinus is here. This is your occipital sinus. Okay, so we go to the cavina sinus. Why is it important to understand the cavina sinus? Because it has a lot of intra- and extracranial communications. It has structures within it and on its wall, and it has a very close proximity to the pituitary gland. So any infection that's going to occur in the cavina sinus will spread from these communications, and it's going to affect the structures on its wall or within it, and anything that's happening on the pituitary gland can affect the structures within the cavina sinus. That is why this anatomy is very important. Again, this is your cavina sinus here, and you have two on the right and on the left side. So this is your cavina sinus. So where is the cavina sinus located? When you're asked to write an essay on the cavina sinus, this is how you begin it. It's located on each side of the cella tussica. Cella tussica is a hypophysial fossa where the pituitary gland is housed. So it's on each side of the cella tussica and the body of sphenoid bone, and it extends from superior orbital fissure to the apex of petrous petrol uh, uh, temporal bone. Superior orbital fissure is here to the apex of the petrous temporal bone. So this is your cavina sinus. So those are the extents from superior orbital fissure to apex of petrous temporal bone. What are the relations? Medially is the pituitary gland and sphenoidal air sinus. Pituitary gland and sphenoidal air sinus within the body of sphenoid. Then superiorly, you have the temporal lobe of the brain above it. Then laterally, around this region, you have the trigeminal ganglion. Okay. And then anteriorly, you have the contents of the superior orbital fissure and optic nerve. Remember, superior orbital fissure carries cranial nerve 3, oculomotor, 4, trochlea, 6, abducens. So all those are in the superior orbital fissure and also the optic uh, nerve is anterior to the cavina sinus. Then posteriorly, there's the petrous temporal bone. So what are the structures within the cavina sinus? The cavina part or the siphon of internal carotid artery and the abducens nerve, cranial nerve 6. What are the four structures on the wall of the cavi lateral wall of cavina sinus? Cranial nerve 3, 4, and first division of thalmic of, of trigeminal and maxillary, second division of trigeminal. 
So the structures on the lateral wall, oculomotor, trochlear, ophthalmic, and maxillary of trigeminal. But within the cavernous sinus, you have the carotid siphon.